the seven deadly sins. They exist in each of us. These are death-dealing sins. They will have a severely damaging effect on one's spiritual life. Lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, greed, anger, and pride. According to Christian theology, committing these deadly sins is as simple as thinking about them. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. Each of these sins has a secret history, revealing how they came to be deadly. The seven deadly sins have had an enormous impact on history, society, and our souls. You cannot transgress God's moral law without someone paying a terrible price. And the sin that puts a price on everything is greed. The seven deadly sins are an important Christian concept, yet they do not actually appear in the Holy Bible. They first appeared in the deserts of Egypt, more than 300 years after the New Testament was written. In about 375 AD, a monk named Evagrius Ponticus retreated to a Christian monastery. There, he began to catalog the temptations to the human soul, creating a list of the most dangerous. Evagrius believed he could narrow the list to eight terrible temptations, and greed was one of the deadliest. Evagrius wrote that greed arose from famines that are sure to come, sickness that will visit us, the pinch of poverty. The seven deadly sins would not be codified until 590 AD, when Pope Gregory the Great re-examined the list of Evagrius. He narrowed the list to seven, changed their name from temptations to sins, and proclaimed that they were deadly. To Pope Gregory, the greedy man was a murderer. He wrote, he who keeps for his own use what would provide for the poor is slaying all those who could have lived from his plenty. Greed, the excessive or rapacious desire for wealth or possessions. This sin goes by many names, including covetousness, acquisitiveness, and avarice. It leads to forbidden activities like hoarding, cheating, corruption, and theft. All people are susceptible to greed all people across classes, types, and professions. Problems come when our possessions control us instead of us controlling our possessions. Some of the earliest examples of the power and influence of the sin of greed are found in the Old Testament book of Exodus. Moses brought God's Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai and gave them to the Jewish people. These basic laws and ethics would become the code by which the faithful would lead their lives. Some religious scholars think that the final commandment, thou shalt not covet, gives perspective on all of the other laws of God. The last one, which is covetousness, is not about an action. It's about a state of mind. And greed is a state of mind out of which all the others come. In the commentary on ancient Jewish law called the Talmud, people become greedy or commit other sins because of their evil impulse, or yetzer hara. To counter this evil impulse toward greed and selfishness, the Talmud made it an obligation to look after others. In Judaism, every community has to have what's called a communal plate, essentially, a charitable fund. And so the idea from the very beginning was that people who had, had an obligation to give to people who didn't. Judaism is not nearly as absorbed with individual sin as Christianity is. Judaism is 
concerned with sin because it interrupts the natural order and because the community, the people of God, are what matters. But despite God's decrees and the sacred laws, the sin of greed prospered in the Holy Land. In 586 BC, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem. In the book of Jeremiah, the prophet interprets this as God's punishment on a nation fallen into covetousness. I will give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners. From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. The Old Testament was not the only ancient text to warn against greed. Around 516 BC, the teachings of Buddha were spreading in India. The religion talks extensively of greed. Upon reaching the state of Nirvana, Buddha laid out the Four Noble Truths that are said to be the essence of his teachings. The second of these is that suffering comes from the craving for earthly possessions, or greed. Buddha's belief in karma led him to also believe that the greedy are punished by being reborn as starving spirits. There is a realm called the world of the hungry ghosts, and these are beings who um, can't uh, get their fill. And as a result, everything turns into inadequacy, disgust, crumbs. By the third century BC, Taoism was having a profound influence in China. The central Taoist book, the Tao Te Ching, attributed to the philosopher Lao Tzu, clearly denounces the sin of greed. The Tao Te Ching just outright says, greed is the source of all man's evil. By 350 BC, one Mediterranean civilization was similarly contemplating the nature of greed. Ancient Greece was fascinated by balance. In architecture and in life, greed was an excess to be avoided. The legend of Midas was a popular description of the sin of greed. Midas was a rich king who wanted to be richer by turning whatever he touched to gold. But after the gods grant him his wish, Midas accidentally turns his food and even his daughter into unfeeling metal and realizes the error of his ways. Some Greek children who heard the tale of Midas grew up to consider greed more deeply, including Aristotle, the philosopher credited with formulating the first code of ethics in the classical world. Aristotle believed that in order to achieve the good life, one must find the balance between excess and deficiency. He encouraged the notion of what he called liberality, the virtue of giving to everyone as much as they deserve. But every virtue has its opposite. If you have a deficit in your ability to give, you are what Aristotle calls avaricious. He means miserly. Aristotle saw greed everywhere and wrote, the avarice of mankind is insatiable. By 27 BC, the glory of Greece had been superseded by the power of Rome. They were masters of much of the world. But many feared that worldly success had corrupted their souls. The Roman writer Horace criticized the decadence he saw around him with a list of seven vices. Avarice, love of praise, envy, anger, sloth, gluttony, and lust. A pagan premonition of the seven deadly sins, with avarice, aka greed, at the top of the list. Horace, however, did not believe the sin of greed led to hell. Instead, greed was its own punishment, a never-ending hunger. Horace summed up the curse of greed with the maxim, the more you acquire, the more you desire. Philosophers criticized greed without getting angry. But in the generation after Horace, 
a figure arose whose anger at men's greed would echo through the centuries and forever change the way the world understood the seven deadly sins. The seven deadly sins. For centuries, they've shaped the behavior of men, but they have not been universally feared. The sin of greed was tolerated and even celebrated during the early days of the Roman Empire. Then, around 30 AD, in the province of Galilee, a wandering Jewish teacher preached against the sin with words that carried a strange and powerful authority. Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed, keep yourselves from covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of things he possesses. He summed up greed when he asked, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus has little to say about the value of accumulating capital or accumulating money, but he has a great deal to say to the poor. And he says, you are the ones that are blessed, not the wealthy. And this, of course, is, is patently false. We know that the lucky people around are the wealthy, not according to Jesus. There really are, I'm sure, strong cultural reasons for Christianity's just disproportionate fascination with greed. And one of them, I think, is, is the fact that money and market comes along about the same time. The Roman Empire's great port of Ostia allowed it to control much of the explosive growth in international trade during this time. Cargoes of food, wine, salt, slaves, and more flowed into Rome from its provinces. It seemed that the more Romans got, the greedier they became. The result was taxes. The Romans, they had an interesting way of doing things. First of all, they would invade you, and then they would charge you for the invasion. They didn't ever collected the taxes themselves, lest they become a riot. So they had locals who were the sellouts collect tax. What one has to bear in mind is that tax collectors made their money by overcharging. The only way that a tax collector had any income of his own was by charging more than the government required. So tax collectors would always charge people more and would end up amassing wealth by effectively preying on the weak, preying on the poor. And Jesus' condemnation of tax collectors is primarily those who are preying on their own brothers and sisters and turning the money over to a foreign government. But Jesus directed his real anger at the lenders of money at the temple in Jerusalem. These men exchanged Roman currency for the local shekels Jews used to buy sacrificial animals. And for this service, they charged a fee. Effectively, they're the equivalent of scalpers at an athletic game or at a show who are charging much more than would be charged if you were to, say, buy the same animal somewhere else and bring it to the temple. They're making a profit off it. Jesus says that you turn into a den of thieves. Not only are you doing business, you're doing crooked business. The sin of greed would play a role in Jesus' demise. When he was betrayed to the authorities by his follower Judas, it was a cash transaction. 30 pieces of silver wasn't a lot of money. And that he was willing to sell Jesus out for that shows you in the clutch, it's amazing what we'll sell out for. When Jesus was crucified, sometime between 26 and 36 AD, the greedy may have been relieved, but his followers took up the attack on the sin of greed. Many think Jesus said money is the root of all evil. But the phrase comes from the first letter to Timothy, attributed to the Apostle Paul. The famous Greek phrase has sometimes been mistranslated. What Paul actually says is that the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the obsessive love 
of money that is the root of all evil. Greed cuts us off from our fellow human beings. Paul's motto was translated into Latin as Rotix Omnium Malorum Avaritia, which in English means the root of all evil is avarice. Somewhere around the end of the fourth century, they began to stack it like an acrostic. So you had Rotix here, and then you had Omnium Malorum Avaritia, and what you've got is R-O-M-A. And it was their way of making a political statement, and you'll find it on some walls as graffiti. The Latin name for Rome became a secret Christian criticism of the empire which they felt had been corrupted by the sin of greed. Some Christians sought escape from the corruption of the Roman world in secluded monasteries. One monk, Evagrius Ponticus, would create the first Christian list of deadly sins, his eight patterns of evil thoughts. Evagrius thought the sin of greed was especially dangerous because it was about fear of the future. You found a lot of monks taking a vow of poverty, and there was a temptation to kind of keep some of that back because you need something to take care of you in your old age. But the problem with greed is this accumulation of more, and more is never enough. How much do you need when you want more? Often, possessions are a way of protecting ourselves against uncertainty, but ultimately we're destined for an existence that reaches beyond this life and beyond anything that we need to protect ourselves against. So there's a danger in investing too much energy in or according too much power to money. Evagrius's list of evil thoughts were little known outside the clergy. But in 400 AD, a contemporary of his, a lawyer turned ascetic named Prudentius, took a similar list of sins and crafted an epic book, The Psychomachia, or Soul Battle. It's an allegory of the conflict between vice and virtue that takes place in all of us. The Psychomachia really informed for almost a thousand years Christian lay thought. Prudentius turned each vice and virtue into a dramatic character who can speak and feel. Prudentius was a genius. For the first time, he personified the sin, and that's part of what's significant here. In the Psychomachia, vices and virtues fight to the death in an epic battle. The personification allowed lay people to more clearly understand the spiritual stakes involved. Several vices are defeated and desert the battle, dropping their weapons, jewels, and gold. The dead and mortally wounded are left, and their blood and smoldering flesh litter the ground. It is at this point that the sin of greed, personified as a haggard woman, enters. Here comes this stark thing, and she has, Prudentius says, claw-like hands and she begins to go in under the dead bodies and under the routed forces and pull up all of the fruit of the battle. Prudentius writes, of all the vices, there is none more frightening. With her arms full of the spoils of war, greed spies a group of priests on the battlefield coming to help the virtues. She tries to tempt them to abandon their vows of poverty, but the priests resist. Seeing that the battle can't be won in this fashion, greed resorts to deceit and transforms her appearance. And she cleans herself up, and she puts on a new dress, and she becomes thrift. Greed pretends her avarice is really concerned for her children's welfare. Greed is ultimately unsuccessful, and her tricks lead to her death. The psychomachia ends with the virtues defeating the vices, 
but the sin of greed would evolve and continue to thrive, even as the Roman Empire collapsed around her. For centuries, the Roman Empire had embraced the seven deadly sins and tried to ignore the consequences. But by 500 AD, it was too late. The once wealthy Rome had drowned in debt, and her overstretched empire had crumbled. Greed and the other sins had helped undermine the most powerful state in the history of the world. Europe slipped into the Dark Ages. The aqueducts were no longer properly working. The sewer system would back up every year and plague would break out. It's a little like the post-nuclear holocaust uh, Australia of the Mad Max films. By 590 AD, only the authority of the church held Western society together. In this anxious and fearful time, Gregory the Great helped transform Evagrius' earlier grouping of temptations for monks into the list of sins we know today. Lust, envy, gluttony, sloth, greed, anger, and pride. The seven deadly sins were born, and all good Christians would need to fear and avoid them. From the point of view, I think, of the church, you can't really be ethical unless you are accountable to some standard. To a person of the church, ethics must be based on the accountability to God. The Christian tenets were soon echoed in a new religion of the time, Islam. The Quran, written by the prophet Muhammad in the seventh century, is the central text of the Muslim faith. The book tells believers that the quest to control base instincts like greed is central to attaining spiritual purity. There's a metaphor in the Islamic tradition of a person uh, who is greedy, is someone who's stooped over with the burden of carrying around these things, and a person who's upright is free from greed. Muslims and Christians fought each other throughout the Middle Ages, especially for control of the Middle East. The Crusades were promoted with holy words. Greed took up the cross as well. In an age when wealth meant owning land, conquering the Holy Land was a chance to strike it rich. Perhaps the greatest of the Crusaders, the English King Richard the Lionheart, met his death through the sin of greed. In 1199, Richard attacked a castle in France searching for treasure. Richard sent his army to capture the gold, and in the ensuing siege, Richard was shot with an arrow in the neck. He died of gangrene, but the cause was the sin of greed. The punishments for the sin of greed were many. In 1306, the English attacked Scottish rebels at the Kildrummy Castle by bribing a treacherous Scottish blacksmith named Osborne. He set a fire that destroyed the defender's food supply. The English took the castle, and Osborne demanded his reward, as much gold as he could carry. The English, disgusted by his greed, melted the gold and poured it down his throat. This gruesome real-life death was echoed in the same period when the Italian Dante Alighieri began his masterpiece, The Divine Comedy, creating nightmarish punishments for sinners. Our notion of hell is not basically scriptural. It's Dante. The story begins with a vision where Dante meets the dead Roman writer Virgil, who guides him into the pits of hell. There, he sees what befalls sinners. In the fourth circle of hell, Dante finds the greedy. They stumble back and forth forever, 
shoving huge weights that may be as heavy as the gold they tried to acquire in life. Dante calls them ill-givers and ill-keepers, the hoarders of money and the squanderers of wealth. These sinners are two sides of the same coin, each unable to control their money. Then Dante and Virgil descend further into hell, to the eighth circle. Here he finds the sinful priests who have committed the sin of greed by selling indulgences. Indulgences were essentially letters of forgiveness from the Pope. A sinner would buy an indulgence, which was supposed to shorten or even eliminate his punishment in the afterlife. The practice meant that greed was now an accepted part of church practice. Dante punishes the priests who profited from selling salvation by sticking them upside down in hell, their feet on fire in a reversal of the baptism ritual. Dante and Virgil move on to purgatory, a place of torment for those whose sins could be forgiven. In Catholic doctrine, purgatory is a place where sins are purged. Sinners must suffer, but eventually they will be rewarded after their punishment with the promise of heaven. When Dante gets to purgatory, the first thing he sees is those who are able to be in purgatory because of the sin of avarice are lying face down in the dirt, repeating a psalm verse, Psalm 119, my soul adheres to the dust. They're face down in the muck of the earth. They can't turn their eyes up the mountain of purgatory to where heaven is to see God. And so that is the ultimate comment uh, that Dante makes on what uh, the sin of avarice is. Dante's Inferno helped shape attitudes towards sin and greed for the next 1,500 years. But it wasn't enough to cleanse the church of greed, especially the form of greed called simony. Simony was taking payment for priestly duties, such as confession, in many ways, it's the ugliest form of greed. When the established religion, when the institution itself begins to deal in greed, there, there is no redeeming value. The belief developed in the Middle Ages that the reason some of the faithful committed the seven deadly sins was because they were possessed by demons. Greed was becoming so widespread that it got its own demon. The fiend's name was Mammon. Christians knew the name from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus warned. You can't serve two masters, Mammon and, and God. You have to pick one or the other. During the life of Jesus, Mammon was an Aramaic word that meant riches or property but the definition would change in the Middle Ages. This term becomes synonymous with a demon. In the study of demonology, Mammon would be reborn in Christian thought as a literal devil, the hell-spawned demon of greed, the enemy of charity, and the destroyer of peace. But as the Middle Ages gave way to the Renaissance, it would seem as though the sin of greed was everywhere. In 1557, Peter Bruegel, the great German painter, depicted the sin of greed in the painting, Big Fish Eat Little Fish. What you've got is the clear statement that, of course, that's how it is. Little fish are there to be eaten so bigger fish can eat them, so, so the system will work. Capitalism was about to evolve, and the sin of greed would never be the same. The seven deadly sins had originally been codified by the Catholic Church as a method for producing more pious behavior from the faithful. By the 16th century, 
piety and greed went hand in hand. The Europeans sailed to the New World to spread Christianity and find gold. The Protestants who settled North America preached the virtues of hard work and thrift, while a rising merchant class piled up personal wealth. By the 18th century, the world was beginning to re-examine the sin of greed and created the next step in its evolution. It was called capitalism. In 1776, a Scottish philosopher named Adam Smith published an examination of commerce called The Wealth of Nations. The book would revolutionize the way people looked at money and greed. Americans think that just one thing happened in 1776, and that is the Declaration of Independence. Actually, something else happened very significant, and in the history of the world, perhaps as significant as the Declaration of Independence, and that was the publication of The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Now, this book was the first document to lay out the principles of economics and to lay out the case that capitalism, economics, self-interested behavior by individuals, acquisitiveness, even greed, might be good. Smith, called the father of modern economics, originally wrote of greed in his 1759 work, The Theory of Moral Standards. He wrote then of the apparent benefits to society of people operating in their own interests, conceiving a world where economics were guided by an invisible hand, The invisible hand is self-interest. It's greed, the motivator of trade in transactions. We trade away something that we, we value less to get something that we value more. Adam Smith assumed that through what he called the invisible hand of millions of people functioning in a selfish way, wanting things that they wanted through the market, that everything would work out fine. Smith furthered his opus on greed with The Wealth of Nations, where he wrote of the pursuit of self-interest, saying specifically that humans were driven by selfishness and greed. The important thing about greed in economics is that greed is taken as a given, that people have a motive to consume more stuff. And the argument in economics is you can harness greed for the social good through free markets, free and competitive markets. But an ugly extension of the market system and the sin of greed evolved at the same time, the slave trade. <coughs> it has been estimated that on the long voyage between Africa and the New World, between 10 and 20% of black slaves and white crew members died. But that was just the cost of doing business. <coughs> By the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution caused another change in the concept of greed. Agricultural slavery was ended by the American Civil War. But a new class of exploited poor found themselves working in terrible conditions in city factories. At the end of the 19th century, the United States emerged as the most prosperous nation on the planet. It also brought about a greedy group of profiteers who came to be known as the robber barons. This group of bankers and businessmen amassed huge fortunes through unethical and anti-competitive business practices. The robber barons. They owned the railroads. They owned the banks. They owned so much of America that our freedoms are being constrained and, and endangered. One of the most notorious and unscrupulous of these men was Jay Gould. This New York financier and railroad owner succumbed to the sin of greed in 1869 when he came up with a brilliant plan to manipulate the commodities market. First, Gould urged President Ulysses S. Grant to stop the government from selling gold. Meanwhile, 
Gould secretly bought up vast amounts of gold in an effort to corner the market. The price of gold skyrocketed, impacting the commodities market and, most dramatically, the price of wheat. Gould figured that the result would be an increase in the price of wheat, forcing Western farmers to ship more of it east on trains he owned. Gould controlled it all, the wheat, the trains, and the gold. Unfortunately for Gould, President Grant got wind of the scheme and instructed the government to immediately sell $4 million worth of gold, effectively killing the inflated prices. Gould's plan went down in flames. Gould's relationship with the infamously greedy politician Boss Tweed allowed him to escape jail. The sin of greed didn't seem to affect Gould in this life. When he died, his fortune was estimated at $72 million. That's more than $1.6 billion in today's currency. Capitalism has always had within it the seeds of excess. And it necessitates people being, to some extent, ambitious and selfish and, yes, greedy. But the Gilded Age of the robber barons would not survive. President Theodore Roosevelt, along with the Supreme Court, enforced antitrust laws that attacked the men he called malefactors of great wealth. We want a, a capitalist system, but we don't want one that is so concentrated in so few hands. And so, for example, the first decades of the 20th century, we had a progressive era. We had antitrust laws that broke up uh, the big concentrations of wealth, the oil companies and the railroad companies. In 1911, the Supreme Court ordered millionaire John D. Rockefeller to break up his Standard Oil Company a monopoly that controlled 70% of American refineries. Standard became 34 separate companies. Stock in the new companies rose sharply. And since Rockefeller held stock in all of them, his personal wealth tripled. Rockefeller became the richest man in the world. the moment would prove a watershed in the evolution of the sin of greed. As the United States grew in the 20th century, the concept of greed would change forever. The perception of the seven deadly sins has evolved throughout history. And no sin has changed as much as greed. The 20th century would become the century of greed, but it was a bumpy ride. The stock market crash of October 29, 1929, ushered in the Great Depression. One of the main causes is thought to be the ill-regulated banking system, which allowed for the greedy few to gain tremendous wealth at the expense of the masses. Gambling in the stock market, I think, is motivated by greed and in self-interest. So there are people trying to turn a small amount of money into a lot of amount of money and you know, willing, simply willing to take the chance. But when the market crashed, it took down the rest of the economy with it. The sin of greed had almost ruined the country. One result of the crash was a fear of big business, and a wave of economic and social reform ensued. The stock market had its ups and downs over the next 50 years. By the 1980s, Americans felt confident enough to embrace the sin of greed. Uh, we had the 1980s and 90s, and perhaps you could say this century so far, the 21st century, uh, where we celebrate uh, not only the mavericks and the entrepreneurs, but we celebrate the people who have acquired huge amounts of money and basically control everything. The 1980s were called the decade of greed before they even ended. The U.S. was at the forefront as President Ronald Reagan's laissez-faire economic policy lowered taxes, cut social spending, and deregulated business. Greed can undermine politics. Uh, the rich, the rich corporations, uh, they get benefits for themselves, subsidies, corporate welfare, tax breaks. 
The 1987 movie Wall Street may have summed it up best when lead character Gordon Gekko, played by Michael Douglas, announced greed is good. And Americans seem to agree. Today, 50% of Americans own stocks. We're going to strike it rich someday, and therefore, we're going to invest in some stocks. But millions of people are trying to beat the market at the same time. They can't, because they are the market. Scripture calls greed sinful. But some scientists say that greed is only natural, not the temptation of the devil, but the prompting of our own neurology. Every action that we take is based on the firing of neurons in our brain. MRIs and sophisticated technology reveal exactly what happens when the human brain turns greedy. Let me just define greed as wanting a lot of stuff, basically. We know a lot about wanting a lot of stuff, and that when you get something, you get a squirt of a, a neurotransmitter called dopamine. It makes you feel good. Animals will press levers that'll bump up their dopamine and, in fact, eventually kill them. They'll just keep pressing the lever. So why don't you just go ahead, click on Start? OK. The bigger the balloon, the more money that you get. Exactly. OK. In this behavioral risk test, subjects inflate a computer-generated balloon. The bigger it gets, the more money they get. But if the subject gets too greedy, the balloon pops, and they lose everything. The question is not greed or no greed. The question is how much greed? How do we tame greed? How do we make sure greed actually works for all of us? To see how greed influences business negotiations, Penn State University economist Dr. Gary Bolton uses a fascinating test called the ultimatum game. The game involves two bargainers, and they're seeking agreement on how to divide $20. I might propose to you that, that you receive $5, and so I would keep $15 for myself. You can accept or reject that $5. If you accept it, the, the pie is split accordingly, 15 5 And if you reject it, we both walk away with nothing. That's it. Those are the rules. No do-overs, just play one time. Almost half of those making offers are possessed by the sin of greed and propose the lowest possible amount. About the same percentage of responders will accept the smallest offer, as long as they get something. Perhaps both sides are greedy, but some are less ambitious. But about 10% have a different take on greed. They insist on a 50-50 split and are willing to walk away with nothing rather than accept what they consider an unfair offer. I think that everyone should get this same amount of money, regardless. This group seems to reject the sin of greed out of hand. But are these people truly renouncing greed? Or is it just a question of how it is defined? It may be the case that the traditional a uh, notion of greed for material things simply needs to be enlarged. That, that people want material things, but they also want, they want social stand. They want to be treated fairly. They want a lot of things for themselves. Wanting something. That desire is the spark that either the devil or DNA can fan into the bright flame of the sin of greed. But I do think that greed is a trait that all people share, and therefore I think it's just part of our biological makeup. But if science proves that greed is part of our DNA, does that really mean we have no control over it? Pope Gregory in Evagrius said greed is evil. Robber barons and Hollywood icons said greed is good, which is correct. No matter the answer, one thing remains true. That's greed. You're never going to defeat her. <laughs>